So, folks, again, just for the movie, this is Thursday, November 14th. Um, we're going to finish up influenza virus. We're going to do just a little tiny bit on polio virus and polio vaccines. And then we're going to start um, unit eight, a really short unit on prions, right? Okay, so let me see what is going on here. Why is the projector not working? Okay, so folks, last time we had really kind of, gosh, gone over a lot with regard to influenza viruses. So let me use the um, more of our uh, PowerPoint slides to illustrate some of the, the key points we are making about influenza viruses. So folks, remember we're focused on the group A influenza viruses because they are the one with zoonotic potential, meaning non-human animals um, can act as a reservoir for transmission to humans. And so folks, this, this, I really love this slide showing some of the, um, some of the variety of influenza <coughs> virus hosts. So it's believed that the original reservoirs or the original host animals of influenza viruses were wild water birds such as ducks. And the reason for this is, is that when we isolate influenza viruses from ducks, you'll see every combination of H and N antigen. And you'll recall there's 16 or more different um, hemagglutinins. Um, nine or more different neuraminidases. And we can find all those varieties amongst influenza viruses of wild water birds. So we think they were the original hosts. And then from the wild water birds, they um, jumped into new hosts. And again, remember folks are RNA viruses, so they're gonna have lots of mutations. And one consequence will be their ability to adapt to a new host and replicate in them. So from the wild uh, water birds, we see the transfer stage to, to domestic poultry, such as chickens and ducks and turkeys. Um, it's interesting folks because um, poultry meat um, from birds that were infected with avian influenza when fed to cats or to tigers in a zoo, the cats and tigers got infected, right? So again, we just see the ability of these viruses to adapt to new hosts. And fascinating, you guys, is marine mammals like seals and whales um, have influenza viruses. Um, horses, ferrets, and pigs have influenza viruses. And of course, very importantly, you guys, for us, humans can become infected. Now, the reason the pig is so important is that pigs can be co-infected with swine influenza, avian influenza, and human influenza. So pigs make what are called wonderful mixing vessels. This is where a single pig cell can be co-infected by more than one influenza virus. And upon um, replication of the RNA segments and packaging, we can come up with those brand new combinations of H and N antigens. And that, that phenomenon, you guys, of um, coming up with new combinations of H and N antigens, do you remember what that's called? That's called antigenic shift. Okay, and we, we'll have some photos here, to, some cartoons, to, um, so that we can review those concepts. And you guys, for right now, I'm going to skip the um, influenza virus replication. We'll just hit a few key events, so I'll come back to this. Apologies. So you guys, so here's, the, um, here's an artist's depiction of antigenic drift. And you guys will recall antigenic drift is when we get small changes in the amino acid sequence of the H and N antigens as a result of mistakes made by the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that copies the influenza virus um, uh, uh, genetics information. And, and I love this, you guys, how the artist depicts it. So we have a, a kind of a green influenza virus affecting this cell of the upper respiratory tract, which would be the ciliated cells. And it's infecting. We're going through uh, biosynthesis when the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase will copy the uh, influenza eight RNA segments making mistakes, right? So we're going to have mistakes in the gene for the H antigen and the N antigen. And then we're going to have assembly and release of the newly replicated influenza viruses. And the results of those little mistakes, those little changes in the H, H, H gene and N gene is now instead of a green influenza, we have what? Kind of a dark blue influenza. Anyway, this is supposed to represent changes in the amino acid sequence of the H and the N antigens. And this phenomenon, you guys, is called what? Antigenic drift, right? And we think it's responsible for local epidemics maybe every two years or so, right? All right, and then, okay, we're gonna fast forward you guys. And this is a more dramatic uh, recombination or reassortment 
when a single host animal becomes co-infected with two or maybe more influenza viruses, and indeed a single cell becomes co-infected with two different influenza strains, right? And again, you guys, I love how the artist did this. So the two parent strains are, uh, let me see, blue and red, right? So they're going to infect the same cell. We have um, biosynthesis, so we have the RNA segments from both of the parental influenzas are copied. And what we want to remember is that during assembly, just randomly, eight pieces of RNA will be gathered together and packaged into the newly replicated viruses. So indeed, you guys will get the parental um, combinations of H and N antigens. But um, as a result of the co-infection, we can get brand new viruses that have new combinations of the H and N antigen. And these changes in the combination of H and N antigens is referred to as what? Antigenic shift, right? And indeed, folks, I think it's antigenic shift that makes the public health officials so worried about influenza viruses causing a worldwide what we call pandemic. And if we look at history, it appears that about every 20 years, we have one of these worldwide pandemics um, um, caused by these new, newly reassorted influenza viruses against which humans don't have any, any um, uh, immunity. And you guys, this, this really didn't make sense to me until in one of the micro books, they listed some of the epidemics and pandemics of influenza viruses, and they described what the new viruses, what the, um, the source of the, of the different um, RNA segments were. So you guys, and this just helped me, on the handout from today, if you look at page three, you'll see here a list of some of the epidemics and pandemics of human influenza viruses caused by the, the group A. And folks, the, the most famous probably influenza pandemic was the 1918 influenza pandemic. And this is fascinating, you guys. They actually were able to dig up the, the bodies of people that had died from the 1918 influenza um, pandemic. And they were able to do the RNA sequencing to find out, you know, what was this horrible strain of influenza that killed 20, 40 million, maybe more, killed, maybe killed over maybe 40 million people. And they discovered what, you guys? All eight RNA segments originated from an avian influenza virus. That is frightening, right? And my thought is, okay, maybe it was antigenic drift. There were some mutations in the avian influenza gene for the, the H. Um, antigen that permitted it to attach to human cells, right? But then you guys are like, well, what about genetic shift? So let's look down at the 1957-58 avian influenza pandemic. And this is fascinating, you guys, because it resulted from the mixture of genetic information from the previous H1N1 strain and an avian influenza strain, right? So in the, in the new human H2N2 strain, there were three new RNA segments from avian strains along with five RNA segments from the 1918 strain, right? Now let's go to the 1960s, the Hong Kong influenza. And here, folks, another brand new human influenza strain, the H3N2 strain. Where did that H3 gene come from, folks? It came from an avian influenza, right? And it, it had, um, we had mixture of an H3 avian influenza with the human H2N2 um, influenza strain. So that new strain had the new avian H3 gene, five RNA segments from the 1918 um, H1N1 strain. And you guys, I, I, it's not that you have to memorize that, but it's just, I, it helped me see why the public health folks are so worried about this antigenic shift. It's when we get this recombination of RNA from like avian influenza with a human strain that we often end up with these huge pandemics that can kill lots and lots of people. Does this sort of make sense, you guys, a little bit more? Okay, awesome. So um, the last pandemic we had, folks, was in 2009, and it is on that list down towards the bottom. And um, this was referred to as the 2009 pandemic strain. It was sometimes referred to as the swine influenza because there's a belief that the pigs, again, are mixing vessels, maybe were the source for humans. But, folks, when they, they did the um, RNA sequencing on the 2009 pandemic strain, 
It turned out it was e either a triple mosaic, meaning a combination of three different influenza viruses, or possibly a quadruple mosaic. So, okay, so let's just read what, where the RNA segments were from. So the 2009 novel H1N1 appears. Um, it's a mosaic of one avian, one human, and one or two swine influenzas. Of the eight RNA segments, one is, one is a human strain RNA, two are avian strains, and five are, are swine strain RNAs. So again, you guys, with the influenza viruses, they have unlimited possibilities to generate new combinations of H and N antigen. And again, folks, the concern is the human population will have no immunity against these brand new strains, right? And that's why we can often see really, really high mortality rates with them. Okay, all right. One thing, folks, to consider, since birds are a wonderful source of avian influenza, and you guys, in birds, where can we find the avian influenza? Not only in respiratory secretions, but where else? In feces, right? So you guys, so if there ever is an avian influenza outbreak, and you're, you're working around uh, live birds or dead birds, you know, watch out for feces, because it can be a rich source of avian influenza. So a, a big concern, you guys, and this was back in the, let me see if I can find this here. Yeah, in 1997, a brand new um, influenza strain that caused really high mortality rates in humans called the H5N1 strain um, caused an outbreak in humans in Hong Kong. And what they discovered was the origin was the live bird market. So in most parts of the world, you guys, you don't go and buy your chicken or your duck wrapped in plastic at the store, right? In most parts of the world, you go to a live bird market and you choose your chicken or your duck alive, you bring it home, you butcher it, right? And then you prepare it to be eaten. So the, 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 the concern with that, though, is that many members of the public can become exposed to the feces, especially of these birds that are carrying this highly virulent H5N1 avian influenza. So um, the public health folks in Hong Kong, they decided to kill all the birds in the live bird markets, and they were able to bring the outbreak under control, but then it reappeared, because it turns out there are wild birds that get infected, and then they can infect domestic poultry, um, and so we'll probably never totally eliminate it from the wild. The hope is for humans will develop an H5N1 vaccine, right, if there was ever a horrible outbreak. And again, folks, the reason we're so worried about the H5N1 avian influenza is it, amongst humans, the mortality rates are really high. So they're around 33%. So that means a, a, a third of the people that get infected, a third of them are going to die. And that's a really high mortality rate. We're going to explore, though, folks, a good thing, probably the reason H5N1 has not become pandemic, is even though there's high mortality rates in humans, very, very, very low transmission rate human to human, right? And we're going to explore why we think that is. <clears throat> OK, let me see here. All right, you guys. So, with the uh, avian influenza uh, replication, I would like you to know that it's a envelope virus. I would like you to know what is the adhesive, folks? What's the, the hemagglutinin, right, on, in the envelope, right? And what is it going to bind to? Sialic acid receptors. Good, excellent, you guys. And then uh, with regard to uh, replication, I would like you to know that the influenza virus is an RNA virus. So can you give me the fancy name of the enzyme that's going to copy the influenza RNA? OK, and, and e, like really detailed, you guys, RNA polymerase is, is like half right, but a little bit more. RNA dependent RNA polymerase, right? So remember, the host cells don't have that. The influenza virus has to bring that information with it. Good. And let me see here, what else, you guys? So, um, oh, I know. Um, so a third step in replication I would like you to know is um, how the influenza viruses escape, and they escape through budding. Okay, so let's take a look here. Okay, so you guys, if we can imagine, this is an electron micrograph, and they color it afterwards, you guys, electron micrographs, as you can see black and white. This is, this is the host cell right here, and these red particles are the newly replicated influenza viruses that are budding. And what's budding? When I, I say the virus is budding, what's happening? Yeah, it's escaping from the host cell, taking a layer of the host cell cytoplasmic membrane, okay? 
All right. Now, this is tricky, though, folks, if we think about it. So now, remember in the um, influenza envelope, what is the adhesin? The hemagglutinin, right? OK. And what is it on the host cell membrane that acts as the receptor for the hemagglutinin? Sialic acid. OK, now let's think about this, you guys. So as the influenza are budding, they're stealing a layer of our cell membrane, right? So you guys, what, what is on our cell membrane? Sialic acid, right? What is in, so, so the envelope then would have sialic acid on it, right? Stolen host cell membrane. And we want to remember that the hemagglutinin is going to bind to the sialic acid. So folks, does it make sense that as these influenza viruses are budding, they might clump together? The hemagglutinin from one virus might bind to the sialic acid on the envelope of another one. Does that make sense, you guys? Right? So this, we finally now, you guys, we understand what is the role of neuraminidase, the second envelope protein. So what neuraminidase does, one of its job is it destroys sialic acid receptors on uh, the influenza envelope. Okay, and this is going to happen during budding. And so as a result, folks, I mean, the advantage for the influenza virus viruses is they're not going to clump together. If they're clumped together, it's going to make it, make it harder for them to, um, to move to other cells. And also, you guys, you could argue, well, it's going to make it easier for our phagocytic cells to phagnotize, you know, this, this clump of influenza viruses. It would probably increase phagocytic killing. So again, you guys, that neuraminidase, what it does is it destroys the sialic acid receptors on the envelope so the viruses won't what? They won't clump, right? Now, who cares? Because guess what? Guess what, folks? Guess what? Have you guys heard of os oseltamivir or Tamiflu? Yeah, does that ring a bell, folks, Tamiflu? Guess what Tamiflu does? It inhibits the neuraminidase. Isn't that awesome? You know, like that's so exciting, right? So the oseltamivir, the Tamiflu, it inhibits the influenza neuraminidase. So you guys, why would that help? What would be the result? Yeah, right. They're going to clump together, right? They're going to be um, easier to phagocytize and destroy. It will decrease their spread, literally their physical spread to neighboring cells. And you guys, this is, this is something I thought about. I mean, is it possible that a newly budding influenza virus could just reattach to the, to the cell membrane here near the budding site? So it just ends up reinfecting the same cell, right? So the neuraminidase then is really, really important to help the influenza virus escape from their host cell, right? So if we can knock out the neuraminidase, we can really slow down their ability to spread to other cells, maybe increase the chance of our um, phagocytic cells being able to clear lots of them, right? And, and folks, um, oseltamivir is an example of an antiviral medication that, that you can give post-exposure. Like, if you think you've been exposed to somebody that has influenza, you can actually start taking. Like, even if you've been infected, you can start taking the Tamiflu, the oseltamivir, and it will help the, it will help prevent the influenza from establishing infection. So I thought that was pretty cool. Okay. All right. And again, folks, this was just to um, remind, remind us of why the public health books are so worried. So that 1918-1919 influenza pandemic, it was so heartbreaking, guys. World War, World War One in, um, in November of 1918, World War One came to a close. But the pandemic actually started the spring before. Probably, probably you guys, we think the H1N1 1918 influenza strain probably originated here in the United States. And they actually think it was a young recruit that might have um, been living on a farm. He might, he might, this is all kind of conjecture, he might have been the original person that picked up the pandemic strain from an animal, not sure if it was a pig or what. 
And so he went to the um, boot camp, right, and spread it. So they had a little outbreak of influenza in the um, army camps here in the United States in the spring. And then, and then the troops got sent to Europe. So basically we spread it to Europe, right? And then from there it spread. So they had a horrible outbreak in the fall of 1918. And then it spread into 1919 after the armistice. The reason it's called the Spanish flu is that it, Spain was a neutral country at that time. So they were one of the few countries that could report in the press of this horrible influenza outbreak, right? So it, it didn't have anything to do with Spain. It was just they were the only ones that could report it. Um, the nations were at war. They have a, what do you call it, you guys, when you suppress the press? Oh my god, you guys. Um, when you don't let the press report the truth? Censored. Yeah, censored, right? Okay, yeah. So when the countries who were at war, they wouldn't let the, the newspapers report these horrible outbreaks, right? You didn't want the enemy to know that you're having this devastating outbreak, yeah. But again, you guys, they, um, they, so many people died, they lost track. The estimates are 20 to 40 million, maybe, maybe even more. There's so many people died, they lost track. So absolutely devastating. And this is what the public health folks are worried about, that we could have recurrence. Now, remember you guys, back in 1918, um, did they have antibiotics? They didn't. But now you're, you're like, wait a minute, antibiotics won't help with a viral infection. So why am I mentioning antibiotics? What's a, if you survive influenza, you guys, what's a common secondary infection? Remember those ciliated cells in the upper respiratory tract are being destroyed, right? Yeah, that mucociliary escalator isn't working anymore, right? So even if you survive influenza, now those ciliated cells can't, can't move that sticky microbial flypaper, that mucus blanket, to the back of your throat for you to spit it out or swallow it. So what happens then, if you inhale bacteria like, what was Frederick Griffith working on, you guys remember? Frederick Griffith was working on which bacterial pathogen? Streptococcus pneumonia, right? So back in the day, if you survived the influenza pandemic, but you picked up a secondary, say, streptococcal pneumonia infection, could you then die from bacterial pneumonia? Uh-huh, right? No antibiotics. So again, that's what Fred Frederick Griffith was working on, trying to find a vaccine to protect from these secondary bacterial invaders. So you guys, that's why we mention antibiotics. Um, nowadays, if you have, if you're relatively healthy, and you have a relatively mild upper respiratory tract infections, they will not automatically give you antibiotics, right? Because of the whole problem with overuse of antibiotics and selecting for antibiotic resistance. But when I was growing up, right, if you came in with a viral respiratory tract infection, very often the doctor automatically gave you antibiotics. Why? To protect you from developing secondary, so secondary bacterial pneumonias. Now they're a lot more careful about it. Okay, but in the old days before, you know, we were aware of how we were selecting for the antibiotic resistance bacteria. It was very common. Viral respiratory tract infection, here's your antibiotic prescription. Okay, does, does that make sense, folks? All right. Now, you guys, this is, to me, is where, oh, this stuff gets like chocolate. It's so exciting. So on page two of your handout, folks, we want to go down about, what, a quarter of the way down. We want to look at the little area there. It says influenza A subtypes H1, N1, and H5, N1, and sialic acid receptors. Because, you guys, we want to try to figure out why is it that human, human adapted strains of H1, N1, say, that are circulating right now, that are not very virulent, why is it that those human adapted strains are relatively low virulence, but high transmission rates, human to human. In contrast, why is it that if a human gets infected with the avian H5N1, why is it that mortality rates are so high, but human to human transmission is so low, right? So what we want to do, folks, is take a look at the difference in the sialic acid receptors for those two, two um, subtypes. So this is going to be a, the human um, low virulence, not, not, the, not the original pandemic strain, you guys. We're, get, we're looking at a human-adapted 
low virulence H1 N1. Okay, so these guys are still circulating. But now, for, for most of the strains that, um, that we see, usually the virulence is pretty low in these human adapted strains. And so low virulence meaning in human infections, relatively low, low mortality rates. But really high human to human transmission. That's why you guys like if we have a little local epidemic of influenza virus, so many of us are going to get sick because one person can infect a lot of other people. So we want to explore that. And then in contrast, you want to take a look at the avian influenza H5, different hemagglutinin, you guys, H5N1. And we're going to look at human infections. And again, folks, what's really frightening about the so-called bird flu is that we have really high mortality rates in humans. But thank heavens, we have low or almost, almost <laughs> no transmission human to human. It's like, what the heck's going on? To, so to explain this, folks, we want to take a look at the sialic acid receptors to which the human adapted low virulence H1N1s bind, and the sialic acid receptors to which the highly virulent avian H5N1 attaches. So first of all, folks, um, okay, this is kind of setting the scene here. So, so folks, so with the avian influenza viruses, when they infect a bird, they can replicate not only in the respiratory tract, but where else in the birds? In the intestines, right? Right? And so we're going to discover the intestines have sialic acid receptors. And again, folks, you want to be aware that in an infected bird, the H5N1 uh, virus can be shed in feces. And as long as the, the feces is moist, how long, how long can the avian influenza virus remain infectious in moist bird feces up to three months right so really important for us to remember for the future okay and then folks in humans it's fascinating we have one type of sialic acid receptor at the upper respiratory tract and we have a different type of sialic acid receptor in the lower respiratory tract and this is going to hopefully help us understand this difference in virulence and transmission so let's take a look you guys at, at these cartoons um, so folks and you guys can you just yell at me if I do this wrong. Okay, so respiratory tract, trachea, right? Well, I'm going to call the upper respiratory tract. And then we have all these cool branching airways here. And then we get down into the lower respiratory tract to the little alveoli, the air spaces where the actual gas exchange will occur. Um, oxygen will diffuse into the blood. Um, the blood releases CO2 and that will be exhaled, right? So you guys, this is the important part of the lungs down here where gas exchange is occurring. Okay, so folks, it turns out that in humans, I have to make sure I get this right. So in humans, we have what we'll call, um, let me just make sure I'm not going to mess you guys up. Okay. Okay. So you guys, in humans then, in the human upper respiratory tract, the type of sialic acid receptors we'll have, we're going to use a shorthand, you guys, we're going to call them alpha-2-6 sialic acid receptors. But what's crucial is that in the lower respiratory tract, Right, where the gas exchange is going on, we have a different type of receptor, an alpha-2-3. Okay, so, heck. So in the PowerPoint slide you gave, in the human upper respiratory tract, what kind of sialic acid receptors will we have? Alpha 2 6, right? And down in the really important region where gas exchange is occurring, what kind of sialic acid receptors? 2 3, right? And you're like, well, who cares? Now, you guys, let's go over to the birds that are um, getting infected with the avian H5N1. And remember, you guys, we said they can replicate in the respiratory tract, but where else? 
in the intestines. And here's the key, you guys. Guess what kind of sialic acid receptors are in the bird's intestines? Alpha 2 3s, right? Okay, so let's do this over here. Okay, so then um, uh, avian, bird, sorry, you guys. So bird intestines have what kind of receptor? 2 3. Okay. Alpha 2 3s. Okay, so who cares? So, folks, if we have a bird that's been infected and the influenza virus, the H5N1, is bound to the alpha 2 3s, right, and replicated, and now it's getting shed in the feces, right? And let's say, I don't know, you guys, we come along and we're, I don't know, playing in the park and we get bird feces on our hands or whatever, or maybe. We're, we're slaughtering our own birds, right? And we have exposure to the um, H5N1 and feces, and we get infected. It's like I'm traveling. Where, you guys, in our respiratory tract, will the avian H5N1 bind? Is the avian H5N1 going to bind up high in the respiratory tract, or is it going to bind down low? Low, right? Because that's where the alpha-2-3 receptors are, right? So they're going to um, replicate in those cells. They're going to trigger really strong inflammatory response, really strong immune response. And what will happen, it, it, uh, because of the inflammation you guys in immune response, one of the results is your, flu your lungs start filling up with fluid. You basically end up drowning, right? Because oxygen does not diffuse well through um, aqueous environments. So you end up drowning in your own fluid, right? But you guys, the, I mean, the only good thing is, is because of the branching airways, like it branches like the like a tree, it's really, really difficult for enough newly replicated H5N1s to make their way through these branching, branching, branching airways to reach, to reach your throat so that there's an infectious dose of H5N1 if I were to cough or sneeze in your face. So it turns out because the avian influenza are replicating so deep in your lungs, rarely does it person cough out enough virus to infect another human. It, I mean, it has happened. It's kind of heartbreaking. There was a story, I think it was in Thailand, where a little girl got infected, and so the mom just held her day and night, day and night, right? And so the little girl's coughing and sneezing the mom's face. That mom did get infected, but it's a really rare event. Okay? So far, does that make sense, you guys? Does that help us understand why avian H5N1 causes such high mortality rates in humans, right? Because they're, they're eventually causing the, um, the decrease in oxygen transport, right, into your blood. Okay. And does it also explain, you guys, why human-to-human -human trans transmission is so low with the avian H5N1? Okay, good. So now in contrast, folks, let's think about uh, the human-adapted strains. The human-adapted strains and you guys, what I should do up here, so these guys, H5N1 binds alpha-2,3 sialic acid receptors in the lower respiratory tract. Okay, now the, the lower variants, you guys, human adapted like H1N1s, these guys are gonna bind, what, what, what would be your guess? They're going to bind the alpha-2,6 sialic acid receptors. And where are, th where are those in us, you guys? Up high, right? Up high. And so that means that usually with these low virulence strains, right, we usually, unless, you know, maybe there's like a secondary bacterial infection, usually there's not, there's not going to be a decrease in oxygen transport because it's not the lower respiratory tract, it's not the cells of the alveoli that are involved, right? They're replicating up high, right? So, I mean, you do get sick, right? But, you know, not as likely to die. But you guys, if the, if the viruses are replicating up high, yeah, up here, where those alpha-2,6 sialic acid receptors are, if, if, I, if I'm infected with a human-adapted strain and I'm coughing and sneezing in your face, do you think I'm coughing and sneezing huge amounts of influenza virus in your body? Yeah. And so the result is, with the human-adapted strains of low virulence, usually mortality rates are low, but transmission is really high, right? And folks, 
this is, you know, we always have to kind of do the caveat, even in, um, even with the low virulence human adapted strains, do you think we can have pretty high mortality rates in our high risk populations? Old folks, right? The very young, anybody immunocompromised. So we still respect them, right? But it's not the devastating mortality rates of avian influenza. Yeah. Okay. So um, some scientists think that for H5N1 to become a pandemic strain, they'll have to mutate so they're replicating up higher, right, before we have a pandemic human-to-human -human transmission. And the hope is if they mutate, right, to replicate up higher, then they will lose virulence. The mortality rate will go down. And that's what I hope, that's what I hope about you guys, because this avian influenza is really kind of a frightening virus. Yeah. Okay. Does that sort of make sense, folks? Okay. And again, I so apologize, folks, we're really shortening this up. Um, because we are running out of time for, for the retroviruses HIV, let me put on the board, folks, what I'd like you to know for the exam. And then, and then I think I shared with you, my plan is to make a worksheet um, that covers more information on HIV AIDS. And any of the additional questions would be bonus questions on lecture exam three, okay? But what I would like you to know, <clears throat> what would not be bonus questions for HIV, so this would be for lecture exam three. I would like you to know that, okay, you guys help me out here. Is HIV an RNA or a DNA virus? RNA, RNA okay. And to which, <laughs> to which family of viruses do they belong? Retroviruses? And um, let me see here. Are they enveloped? Yes. Okay, enveloped, good. That's really good news for us, right? That's really good news for us. Okay, and you guys, What's the name of the enzyme that's going to take the HIV RNA and carry out reverse transcription? Yeah, reverse transcription. And you guys, in step one, so the enzyme is called reverse transcriptase, and it carries out reverse transcription. In step one, you guys, how is the HIV reverse transcription behaving? So what's the, what's the template? Good, you got it, you guys. What's the template? RNA, so it's an RNA dependent, and what's it going to make? Yeah. DNA, good. So it's going to be an RNA dependent DNA polymerase, okay? And folks, this is really important. Does reverse transcriptase proofread? No proofreading, no proofreading, good. And folks, it turns out that there's two more steps in HIV replication um, where either proofreading doesn't occur or we get a mixing of HIV RNA segments. So HIV carries two RNA segments, so we can get mixing of RNA from different HIV strains. So the result is we have really, really high genetic variation in HIV, and that's why so far we can't develop the vaccine. That's why HIV rapidly um, evolves drug resistant. It's why our immune systems can't protect us. Like we get infected with one strain and it will have an immune response, but then it mutates so rapidly the immune system can't keep up with it, okay? So, so you guys, this I would like you to know for lecture exam three, and then any additional information on the worksheet and I'll supply a key with it would be bonus questions, okay? Because it's a heartbreak for me that we don't have time to go through it, okay? So you guys, so then I'm going to skip over the HIV slides, and, and I'll, add, I'll put this in the worksheet, you guys. The good news is we now have, we now have anti-HIV drugs that can block almost every step of HIV replication. Yeah, and that is something that we should be really celebrate that. That's really good. But we still need, we still need a vaccine. Okay. So you guys, and we're going to skip the arboviruses. Oh, this is heartbreaking. We just need a two-semester micro course. You're going to no, we don't. <laughs> okay. So, you guys, just the last little bit on RNA viruses, and again, it's related to vaccines because I think that is really important information that we take from a microbiology class is knowing which infectious diseases 
um, can be prevented, or at least we can reduce the severity by vaccination. Okay, so folks, the, 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 the polio virus is a bad news virus from a human perspective because it lacks an envelope. It's a naked virus. Why, why is that bad news from a human perspective? Yeah, because that means if it gets shed into the environment, it's going to remain infectious for a long period of time because the adhesins are on that tough, tough resistant protein capsid, right? And what's the second bad news for us humans? What's its genetic information? RNA, right? So what does that tell us? It has the potential for really high mutation rates, right? Okay, and, and you guys, just a, just a little abbreviated um, um, infection cycle. So transmission is fecal orally, right? Because the, the polio virus replicates in the intestinal tract. So it makes sense, right? It's shed in the feces. And because it's a naked virus, it can remain infectious in the feces for a long period of time. So wherever feces goes, it contaminates food or drinking water or, or swimming pools, right? Um, and if you ingest it, then you can get infected. Now, in I have to be careful here because I don't have the statistics, but in, how should I say this? In many people to get infected, they'll have replication of the virus in their intestinal tract, and it will not invade the nervous system. But then in a, in a subgroup of people that get infected, the virus invades the nervous system and can cause paralysis. And the paralysis can involve the uh, paralysis of the muscles used in walking. So you'd see um, crippled children, right, that couldn't walk. And in severe cases, it would cause paralysis of the muscles involved in breathing. So you could just suffocate. You could just die. And this is a picture, you guys, of one of the iron lung wards that was probably pretty common in the maybe the 40s and 50s before we had the polio vaccines. And these people are surviving in these iron lungs, and what would happen in the iron lungs, it goes through cycles of um, positive pressure, negative pressure, positive pressure, negative pressure, so you could passively breathe. But boy, you guys, what a tough life, right? So there was good news, and do I have a table on this? Yeah, yeah, okay, so you guys, so there was good news because two scientists, apparently they were competing with one another to develop a polio vaccine. And the first person to develop a polio vaccine was Salk. So, and I think this was in the 1950s. So the Salk inactivated, inactivated polio vaccine was developed. And inactivated, you guys, means it's like a kill vaccine virus. It, it, it's dead. No, it can't cause infection. But... Um, so, and it's often abbreviated as IPV. So this is the so-called dead, the dead um, vaccine virus. So you guys, do you think a dead vaccine virus can cause disease? No, it can't, all right? Um, one of the drawbacks was it had to be injected into, uh, injected IM intramuscularly, so you needed sterile syringe and needles, right? And people that could do it. Um, and certainly little kids are not going to be keen to go get their polio vaccine, right? Because it means they're going to get a shot, and those hurt, right? Um, and, um, and, and furthermore, folks, I'm sorry, I'm just like, oh, my God, just like becoming demented here. Okay, so furthermore, what it, what it does is it triggers um, protection, uh, production of um, serum IgG. And, and the reason this was helpful, you guys, is because you have circulating IgG, which can be a neutralizing antibody. The, the importance here is that it, it prevents spread to the nervous system. Prevents spread of what we call the wild type virus, the virulent virus. Right, so it, it prevents the worst um, damage, right? It, it would prevent paralysis. You might still get infected with a wild type virulent, virulent polio virus. It, would, it could replicate in your intestinal cells, you could shed it, but it's like, who cares, right? Because you're not gonna become paralyzed, right? But there was that disadvantage, it has to be injected, you have to get multiple injections, 
and it doesn't provide protection from, from infections of the intestinal cells with a wild type virus, right? But boy, that's awesome. You know, prevent people from becoming paralyzed. <clears throat> and then the, his competitor, I, I should have done this backwards, okay. So in the 1960s, his competitor, Sabin, developed the oral polio vaccine. And what do you think the initials are for that, you guys? You always see it, OPV. And um, the OPV was a live attenuated, uh, live attenuated vaccine virus. So what does that mean, you guys? Yeah, you, you ingest the virus and it attaches to your intestinal epithelial cells and replicates in your intestinal epithelial cells. So then you actually, when you get vaccinated, you're shedding in your feces, what? Yeah, it replicates in the intestinal cells. So you end up shedding vaccine virus. Shed, you shed. You shed vaccine virus in your feces. And this was thought to be awesome because in, in some places where maybe it was hard to vaccinate everybody in the family, if you could if vaccinate one family member, um, and I love this, you guys. So like, usually like in a flush toilet, if you defecate in it and then you flush it and you don't put the lid down, what happens? You get fecal aerosols, right? You get fecal aerosols. And I don't know about you guys, but where's my toothbrush? In the bathroom, right by the toilet, right? So, mm, I'm not, no, anyway, but so the idea was, you guys, is that if you could, like in theory, vaccinate one person in the family and then that person is shedding feces, then you could then indirectly vaccinate the other members of the family, right? Because through the fecal aerosols, you end up basically, I know it sounds goofy, guys, but you end up swallowing, potentially swallowing the virus. And then you could vaccinate, you know, more people than, than the one in the family. And the other thing, you guys, that to me was really important as a kid, is because if you don't have to inject it, you swallow it. So when we were going to school, we couldn't wait for polio vaccination day because what they would do is they would put drops of the polio vaccine on a sugar cube. We got to eat a sugar cube, right, for polio vaccination. So we weren't afraid of it. We look forward to it. It's like, I'd like to be vaccinated again, please, right? Okay, so it was orally, right? Okay, oral administration, right? So people aren't afraid to get it. Yeah? Um, is the oral vaccine as common anymore? Because I know that, like, that is right, Alicia. I, I should give you chocolate chip cookies for that. It's like I planted you there for that. Okay, so let's, you are right. Okay, so you guys, like I said, when I'm, I'm growing up in the 50s and 60s, we were getting the sugar cubes. Oh, yeah, we love this polio vaccination. But you guys, what do we know about polio virus? What kind of a, what kind of a virus is it? Okay, good, non-envelope and RNA. So, folks, if when I was a little kid and I got the oral polio vaccine and the vaccine virus is replicating in my intestine and I'm shedding the vaccine virus, was I potentially shedding mutant viruses? Yes. And what is the horror story? What do you think happened? It reverted to virulence, right? What does that mean? It can, it can revert to virulence. What does that mean? What's the nightmare with polio vaccines? Yeah, they mutate so that now they can do what? In fact, yeah, it causes infections in the central nervous system. So now this mutated vaccine virus, if somebody swallows it, what will happen? Instead of preventing polio, it causes polio. And can you guys imagine the heartbreak of parents who vaccinated their kids to prevent polio and the vaccine itself caused polio? Or, or you guys, maybe the vaccinated child didn't develop polio, but the <laughs> mutant viruses and the feces maybe caused other family members or friends to develop polio. Does that make sense? So the heartbreak is that um, the oral polio vaccine, it's really low, you guys. The chances are really low. But there have been 
polio cases caused by the vaccine virus. Does that make sense? So what happened, like Lee Shaw was saying, and in the United States, when the, um, the uh, prevalence of polio wild type cases went down, they finally decided, you know what? It's not worth the risk. It's not worth the risk of continuing to use the oral polio vaccine. We're going to go back to what? The inactivated. So does that make sense, you guys? Yes. Yeah. So now in the United States, I think most often kids are vaccinated with the, the inactivated. And it's like, yeah, you can see there's the disadvantage of you know, being painful. But the inactivated polio vaccine, you guys, it's never going to cause polio. There's some parts of the world where it's really hard to reach people to, to give them the vaccinations. So in some parts of the world, they still recommend they do oral polio vaccine because they, they think they can protect more people. And it's kind of like the, the risk-benefit analysis, yeah? But here in the United States, I think, again, just like Alicia said, that we've gone back to the safer inactivated vaccine. Now, one advantage, you guys, I should have talked about the advantage here, and this will make more sense after we do immunology. Um, an advantage is, and this will make more sense when we do Im in immunology, is this vaccine, it triggers production of not only IgG, right, that, that prevents spread to the central nervous system, it also triggers, so here's our IgG, it also triggers what's called secretory IgA, and secretory IgA, you guys will find later, it plays a really important role in mucosal immunity. So we could argue the oral polio vaccine, it actually triggers like a more complete uh, immune response. We get mucosal immunity, we get um, IgG protect us from spread to the central nervous system. But again, you guys, it was like eventually the disadvantage, the cost of the oral polio vaccine outweighed advantages. Does, does this make sense, folks? Okay, all right. And it, it, again, hopefully in immunology we'll come back and we can use the, the two polio vaccines as an example of different types of immunity that can be triggered by our vaccines. Okay, all right. Okay, you guys, I think that's it. Yeah, and we're not going to do norovirus. So you guys, on RNA viruses, again, big, obviously a lot on influenza virus, lots of questions on influenza virus. Um, the questions on polio virus are probably focused primarily around the vaccines. Okay? All right. Okay. So, folks, with that, then we're going to leave our uh, viruses and we're going to move on maybe just like half an hour lecture on prions. Okay? And a lot of this you guys know already. I mean, you guys know most of the basics on the prions. And, folks, there was a, um, a new handout just with some... Um, some key ideas and, and some details like on clinical signs and symptoms that I would not ask. But some people are really fascinated um, knowing about the development of clinical signs and symptoms. So there is on page two, you guys, a lot of detail on possible clinical signs and symptoms that I won't ask you. I'll only ask you basically what we're going to discuss um, dealing with the PowerPoint slides. All right? Okay. So again, you guys, you know a lot of this already. So it's going to be a lot of review. Okay, so this is the prion PowerPoint, you guys. So we're talking about disease-causing prions. And prions are supposed to mean proteinaceous infectious particles, but that always confused me because I keep thinking it shouldn't be proin, but I guess, oh well. Okay, so prions, are, they're acellular. They lack nucleic acid. They're abnormally folded cellular um, proteins found on um, cells, found on and in cells of the nervous system. And unfortunately, we're also discovering them in leukocytes, white blood cells, so we find them in lymphoid tissue. And folks, if we compare, and this is a kind of a delicious exam type question, if we compare the levels of protein structure between the good normal cellular prion and the misfolded disease-causing prion, primary structure, the amino acid sequence is the same, but secondary st structure changes, tertiary and quaternary structure changes, right? So, and you might remember this from previous lectures. So in the normal cellular prion, it, they're rich in alpha helices, relatively low in alpha beta pleated sheets, excuse me, in beta pleated sheets, sorry you guys, the blue arrows represent beta pleated sheets. And you can see on the slide when they misfold to the disease-causing form on the right, we have a decrease in alpha um, helix composition and an increase in beta pleated sheets. 
the normal prion can be denatured easily. What about the abnormally folded one? It is so hard. Will normal autoclaving denature? No, they are just miserable to denature. So they cause a family of diseases, a family of um, fatal neuronal diseases called TSEs, first transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. It would, the, the actual discovery of what the prions were, it was made here, here in the Bay Area by Stanley Christner at UC San Francisco. And you guys, it's the same old story. People said he was crazy. He said, there's a pathogen causing these um, a neurological diseases, and this pathogen has no nucleic acid. It has no genetic information. And he was laughed at, you know, the same story that we hear over and over again when people come up with new ideas. And eventually he was proven right and received the Nobel Prize. So remember, you guys, we all, in our chromosomes, we have the gene, the prion protein gene, right? We all have prion proteins right now. It's just they're not misfolded. So we don't worry until they misfold, right? So um, again, folks, you know in biology, we're always using abbreviations. So for the normal cellular prion, you guys, they use this abbreviation, PR for prion, and then big P for protein, and the superscript C is for cellular, good ones? And then in honor of the oldest prion disease that we know of, scrapie, the misfolded ones are called PRP, superscript SC, for the scrapie prions, indicating these are the misfolded ones that cause disease. And, and folks, I'm, you know, there's so many questions in my mind about prions. So I was just like, well, where are they, you know, on, on um, cells of the nervous system? So I just found this link. And the, the link to the whole paper there is, is, the whole paper is there on the PowerPoint side, you guys. But this, here we have, you know, our presynoptic neuron. And the prions, you guys, are these, they look like little blue lollipops. So they have, they have prions here in these um, vesicles containing neurotransmitters. They have them on the surface of the neurons here, right? And, and what I was trying to find was a simple explanation of what the normal function of the prions are. And there's a big, long paper, you guys, that I, I couldn't understand. I'd have to have you A&P folks explain it to me. Um, but there's a thought they might have to do with memory. There's a thought they might have to do with neurotransmitter um, release or um, receptors. So, I, 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 I'm, I'm very saddened that I can't give you a better um, description of normal prion function, right? But we know when they turn bad, it's fatal for the neurons. I mean, we know what bad prions do. I'm just not really clear yet if they've defined what it is that the good prions do. So, folks, again, this is all review. So we want to remember, this is the cartoon I always do, you guys, with just using my hand. So... Let's say this is a shape of a good normal prion that doesn't cause disease. This is a shape of an abnormal prion. So the hypothesis is an abnormally folded prion binds to a good prion and causes it to do what? Misfold, right? And now we have two, and they can bind to two more normal prions and cause them to misfold. So it's like a, um, an amplifying cascade. Yeah. So once, they, once one binds to another and misfolds, do they then separate and spread out? They, they can. Do? They can. They can separate. But, but... But they can also then stack together. So, and that's a new level of structure, quaternary level of structure. So the model is then the misfolded prions, they can then stack together, forming these fibrils or filaments of misfolded prion, right? It, we, this is kind of the, the cartoon here, folks. So they can form these long filaments of misfolded uh, prion proteins. And then the, the um, filaments can bind and tangle. And this is what we'll see in the brains of humans or animals that have died of prion diseases is these massive tangled misfolded prion proteins. And some people say it looks a lot like Alzheimer's disease. So there's um, the gene associated with Alzheimer's is different than the prion gene, but the kind of the model of the disease where Alzheimer's is caused by misfolded proteins looks awfully similar to prion disease. So a lot of interest in prions as a model for Alzheimer's. Yeah. So we get the fibril, um, the fibrils formed, you guys. And again, I, I'm trying to find a real simple reason for the neuron cell death. Um, but the tangled, misfolded prions, they cause holes to form in the brain because they're triggering the neurons to undergo op apoptosis or um, programmed cell death or cell suicide. 
And so if you have enough neurons destroyed, what's going to happen to your brain? It's going to get holy, right? So, and again, you guys, this is all review from previously. But if this is a, a pathology slide from a normal human brain, it's been stained, we're looking at it with a light microscope. Notice there's no holes, right? That's a healthy brain. Here's a brain of a poor person that died of the um, transmissible prion disease called Kuru, and this is the one caused by the mortuary cannibalism, which we'll mention. This is the classic old person's form of prion disease, you guys. This is called classic Fritzel Jacobs disease. This happens, and this is kind of scary, in some of us, as we age, our prions start to misfold. And we don't know why. I mean, it's really frightening, right? Because it's like, you know, I gotta have that happening. But the, we'll get the same results, you guys, the, um, the holes in the brain. But remember, this is an old person's disease. It's not a disease of young people. Yeah, uh, So I have a friend that was in class with last semester. Yeah. Uh, she actually ended up leaving class because her mom got diagnosed with CJD. <sighs> and it was one of those things, like, nothing came on, there were no signs and symptoms. And she looked she wasn't on the group. And it was just like over a period of actually like the summer, she went from uh, being completely normal person to she's completely bed down. Uh, she's in like three alive, months. But there's nothing there. Just like the deterioration. Do you know Charles by any chance, and there's actually a reason for this, do you know by any chance if she'd spent any amount of time in Britain? I can ask. It would be really interesting, yeah. right? And and there's a link there, you guys, because of back cow disease. Anyway, we'll get there, right? Because that's, yeah. They won't let me donate blood because I was living in Britain the year before they had the outbreak of mad cow disease, and they're worried that some of us may have been infected with really long So you guys, if I'm up here going blah, 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 it's like, ah, she's got it. It's that, no, I don't, I don't mean to make, I do not think that's so bad. That's so bad. But anyway, it might be. So Charles, you watch and say, no, you're starting to ask, act like my friend's mother. There. Anyway, okay, and, and you guys, seriously, I don't mean to make light of this. Sometimes it's so grim, though, we'll use kind of maybe inappropriate humor because it's just so grim. Yeah, I don't mean to show disrespect. Yeah. So do genetics play a role in this too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also yeah. Friends in the family, right? Yeah, That's there's nice. there's familial forms that are, that are scary, autosomal dominant. But that's not that common. What's really frightening, you guys, is the sporadic form, where it's like there is a variation in the amino acid sequence of your prions that increases your risk for sporadic folding, but it doesn't guarantee it. So it's still very, we're still trying to figure it out, right? Okay, but we'll, we'll come to that. Thank you, Michelle. And then, folks, this is the prion disease of um, goats and sheep called scraping. And again, what do we see in these holes in the brain, right? And because the prion can be transferred from one host to another, it's called transmissible. It's causing our brains to look like sponges with holes in them, right? So um, spreadable, holy, not like holy we pray, holy as in holes in it, um, encephalopathy, brain disease. Yeah, 100% fatal. We don't have any treatments, you guys. We don't have a vaccine. Ah, oh my gosh, yeah. Okay, so again, folks, why the holes in the brain? So I don't think they totally understand yet. They think there might be signaling, interruption, right? Because remember in that picture, you guys, presynaptic neuron, postsynaptic neuron, maybe there's an interruption in um, signaling that causes cells to trigger the program cell death. I don't, I don't know, you guys. And I keep trying to find like a simple explanation. And it's just, it seems like the papers, the research is so complicated. I, I'm not there yet to give you a nice, you know, concise explanation. Now, folks, this is really important. Please remember this for lecture exam three. The heartbreak is our immune system doesn't recognize the misfolded prions as foreign. Therefore, we don't mount an immune response. There's no inflammation. There's no immune response. There's no antibodies produced. And you might say, well, who cares? Well, for many infectious diseases, you guys, how do we detect if a person is infected? We look for antibodies against the pathogen. So. So we could, like, like me, right? It's like, could I have gotten infected with prions in Britain? It's like, well, if my immune system made antibodies against the misfolded prions, they could just take a blood test and tell me, oh yeah, you got them, right? But we can't do that. There, it's, it's really, really hard to diagnose prion diseases in the incubation period, which can be really long. It can be like years long, where you're infected, but you're not showing clinical signs or symptoms yet. Yeah, so this is really, really tough, you guys, that we don't have a quick blood test 
to tell if a human or an animal is in, infected with the disease-causing prions. That, we sure need that one. So you guys, and again, I think most of this is review. So just a little bit of history. So the early recorded, um, the early recorded, um, oh my God. See, it's that prion at work, you guys. Okay, our earliest record of prion disease is from Britain um, in the 1700s. And farmers were noticing that their sheep and goats sometimes started acting kind of weird. Um, and for example, the sheep and goats might scrape themselves against a wall or a fence or something. So I know when I was in college, they said it might be because the animals feel like they have this, um, um, yeah, an incurable itch, right? But, but another thing that might be going on, you guys, because in, when you see the prion disease in the foray people of Papua New Guinea, um, it damages their ability to balance themselves. And so you'll see the victims, they're off balance like this. And so I'm like, well, I wonder if that's going on with the sheep and the goats. They're using the fence or the building just so they can stay upright. Um, but in the process, they end up scraping off their uh, their wool, scraping off their hair. And that's bad news, you guys, because guess what? If you leave, you know, against the fence or the barn, you're leaving, you know, those infectious prions behind. And then if another animal comes around and just has a regular itch, right? And they damage the skin, those, those prions, there that are going to survive for years and years can then infect that animal. Um, it was in the 1920s, folks, that that Creutzfeldt-Jakob's disease was diagnosed. Again, they didn't. They, nobody knew what was causing these things. 100% um, uh, fatal neurological disease, Creutzfeldt-Jakob's disease, CJD. 50s, Kuru, amongst the 40 people, Papua New Guinea was diagnosed. And again, nobody knew what was, what was the cause. They didn't know there was a link between all of these neurological diseases. So there was a big breakthrough, folks, um, in um, understanding the transmission of Kuru you know, amongst the 4A people of Papua New Guinea. Um, so one thing that anthropologists, sociologists had noted, and also the, the um, an Australian physician that went to live with the 4A people was they had a way of honoring the dead of their, of their families and their tribe in a process known as mortuary cannibalism. So in this process, if a, if a loved one died, the women would prepare the body, and the body would be consumed. And, and I know this sounds weird, you guys, in our culture, but it's like, I get it. It's like, you kind of you kind of want, want the spirit of the person to continue on, right? So maybe it was kind of symbolic that, that maybe in consuming the tissues of the dead person, you're consuming the spirit of the, the person. And I know in our culture that sounds weird, but it's like, I, I think I understand it. Um, and they were killing the people to eat them, you guys. These were, these were family members, tribe members that had died, right? So it was, it was an act of respect, I think. But what happened was the women were, were responsible for preparing the body. And because the bodies, you guys, would be chock full of prions, probably in, in the process of using sharp knives and preparing the body, the women were probably getting cut, right? And that permitted entry of the prions. And the other, the other thing, folks, and I don't know if this is right, but I read that the men, the men that were gonna consume the body, they would use, usually eat like meat, right? Muscle, right? And the women and children instead would, would maybe get brain, maybe the intestines. And the brain and intestines, you guys, those are the areas chock full of prions. So the, the women and children would be consuming the parts of the body that have the highest prion load. So as a consequence, when Kuru started to spread, who did it hit? And really kind of the women and the children. And in fact, you guys, there's a documentary, I have a link to it. It's this incredible Australia documentary on, on Kuru. Um, if you have a chance, you guys, to watch it, I, I still recommend it. But it's so sad. It's really depressing. It's really, really sad. Um, but one of the one of the four A people that they interview, he said there were no women left. All the women had died. Right. So this was really devastating. So one hypothesis is, folks, is that you know how did this get started? Well, maybe one of the older members of the four A people had developed a spontaneous old age Creutzfeldt Jakob's disease. Does that make sense? Right. But because of mortuary cannibalism, <coughs> right, the prions then were spread amongst the family, friends, and the tribe. And then they developed Kuru, they died, 
and then their tissues, trochoid prions, were spread among. So you can just see that it would go, it would be another of these amplifying cascades. So eventually, folks, the mortuary cannibalism was halted, and the number of Kuru cases went down dramatically. However, because prions can have a really long incubation period, they are still worried that there might be the older, 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 older members of the of the foray might still be incubating the prion disease. But there's no more mortuary cannibalism, right? So it should eventually, like, die out. If that, I don't know, if that's the right term or not. But right, but but stop spreading. And again, you guys, if you have a chance, this is the link to the, um, the Australian documentary Kuru: The Science and the Sorcery. And again, folks, be, if you're already kind of sad or or wiped out, don't watch it because every time I watch it, I cry, and I've seen it probably ten times. It's fascinating science, but absolutely heartbreaking when you see these little kids that are dying of this really horrible disease. But a fascinating documentary. So okay, just a little bit, a little bit on this, you guys. So what what we would call the sporadic form, right, where our prions misfold when we're older, about one case per million. So it's not it's not that common, right? Um, and they talk about four different types, and this is what I think what you're asking about. So there's inherited familial forms, and unfortunately, the gene is what they call autosomal dominant. So if you get one of the um, disease-causing prion genes from one parent and a normal gene from another, like that, that the, um, the misfolded prions from that one bad gene is going to mean you're going to develop the, the prion disease itself. So of, of the cases you guys about... 10 to 15% are the inheritor or familial form. Iatrogenic, you guys, this is kind of a nightmare. Iatrogenic literally means the doctor causes it. So this means medical procedures in which either tissues that contain prions maybe are used in transplants, right? So corneal transplants, um, dura mater transplants to the central nervous system. Um, you, as a, as a transplant recipient, you receive tissues from a donor that is incubating a prion disease, and of course nobody knows, right? Or there are medical instruments that are used on a person with a prion disease, and the medical instruments become contaminated, and then they don't know, and then they use the instruments on another person. One, one that I've heard a lot about are <coughs> electrodes that are used for brain studies, right? So the electrodes, I don't think you can, I don't think you can autoclave electrodes, right? Probably the best thing is you use them and incinerate them, right? You start with a brand new pair. So just remember that, you guys. Bring your own electrodes if, if they're going to do that to you. Um, in the old days, you guys, and, and kids, one of my friends, she didn't, she didn't grow, you know, well. And so in the old days, they would take from human cadavers, they would harvest the pituitary gland to extract what? Human growth hormone, and they would inject kids with that. So it turns out that some of those pituitary extracts were contaminated with prions. So again, it, through a medical procedure, we spread the prions. Yeah, okay. Um, and, then, and then folks, uh, about the majority of the cases are these sporadic cases where just with old age, our prions start to misfold. Very kind of troubling. But again, folks, in the sporadic form, this is old folks, not you guys. This is old folks. And this is the one that's really troubling, folks, the very increased dangerous disease. This was identified in young people in Britain. They were presenting with cranial Jacobs disease. But remember, young people aren't supposed to get this. Um, and so it was finally tracked back that these young people had gotten infected eating what? Beef, right, from cattle that had the mad cattle prion, the bovine spongiform encephalopathy prion, right? And so you guys, on that happy note, this is, too, this is Thursday, right? So you guys, what we'll do is we'll, we'll finish prions on Tuesday. And then you guys will start the second to the last unit, medical micro, on Tuesday. So we're, all, we're almost finished, OK? All right, you guys, so I'll see half of you in lab. And the other half, you guys have a good, safe weekend, OK?
so much. Oh my god, how, how heartbreaking. Yeah. Heartbreaking. Gosh, Charles. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, you guys. Um, I haven't checked it. I still haven't emailed you about the change in the grade. Do I still need to do that? Please do. Okay, that's I still I'll haven't done it. Thank that's you. Fine. Yeah. You, guys, you. You guys are my backup brains. <laughs> that's fine. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, so Thank you so much. I don't have them with me, but if you have time to walk down with me to the office, I can...